Hi, good morning and welcome to the first talk of this morning at Recruiter. First, let me introduce myself. I'm Christophe Gond. I've been a, a long timer in Clojure. I've been working in Clojure since uh, 2008. I discovered Clojure when it was maybe three or six months old and I worked mostly exclusively with Clojure since then. I'm an independent software developer up to two years ago where I joined forces with Baptiste Dupuch. Together we are Tensegretics. Tensegretics is governed by two simple rules. The first rule is that I'm always right. The second rule is that if I'm wrong, it's always Baptiste's fault. Here is the story of how I got tricked into writing a closure port. It's Baptiste's fault. For a long time, he wanted to write a Lisp implementation and he was also very interested in trying to reach out to mobile development. At the start of the, of the first lockdown in Europe, so spring uh, 2020, Baptiste got enough time to try to evaluate the options. And among the options, he first evaluated targeting Swift and after some time, he settled on Dart and Flutter. It was totally not on my radar, not a single blip. I was quite amused by his sensitive. In the following months, I don't know if it's a pure coincidence or me paying more attention on social media to, to Dart and Flutter, but I noticed it here and there and seeing mostly positive reviews, especially about Flutter. And uh, I think that the tipping point was when I heard both David Nolan and read a positive tweet by uh, Patrick Logan about Flutter and Dart. Um, so maybe there was something true in, or at least valuable in what Baptiste was trying to achieve. I talked a bit more with, with him and at last he convinced me. As of late September of 2020, I bid to, to help him write Closure Dart. But first, maybe you are like me. You have no idea or very faint, faint idea of what is Dart and Flutter. They are both Google products. Dart is kind of a very typical static language. There are a couple of things which are interesting in Dart. First, it is able to target either JavaScript, its own VM, or native code, be it x64 or ARM. Another interesting part is that it seems to have a conflicted relationship toward dynamism. Maybe it's because it's, it's sorry, how it grew as a language. Last, because initially it targeted JavaScript, its concurrency story is almost the same as JavaScript. You have workers communi communicating through messages. You don't have shared memory concurrency. Flutter is a cross-platform GUI and it allows you to target mobile. It also targets web through Canvas and it, um, it now reaches out to desktop even. It's becoming more and more comforting to use Flutter to make this sub application. As I alluded to earlier, that dynamism is a bit conflicted. You don't have dynamic loading, but you have really good hot reloading in the .vm. It's statically typed more than Java, but it has a pseudotype named dynamic, which, which changes the way methods are resolved. When you use dynamic, you are close to what you get in Java when you are using reflective calls. There's also a funny runtime type property which can be overridden. When you override it, you can make it without anything. So runtime type can blatantly lie. In the same vein, you can only check whether an object is an instance of a class if the class is a compile time constant. So you can't implement instant question mark now, the chronology of the events. In the spring of 2020, Baptiste started to work on Closure Dart by itself. 
and that of uh, September, I joined him. We decided to reboot. Our goal was to write a very min minimal compiler in Dart for a subset of closure. The compiler would evaluate closure code and use the auto-reading mechanism of the Dart VM to patch itself, replacing very simple stuff written in Dart by actual implementation in closure and so on. So growing the subset of closure until you get a whole language. It was too ambitious. We had a hard time keeping track of what was the current subset. Plus, subsetting closure is not that easy. So two months later, we changed our mind and decided to run the compiler in, inside an existing closure implementation, a more typical bootstrap strategy, where you write the compiler in the language itself and you use an existing implementation to compile the compiler and get the actual compiler. In one day, we ported the compiler we had in Dart to Clojure. It was a single pass compiler. One month later, we realized that we needed to introduce another phase. So we split the single pass in two and introduced an inter intermediate representation based on S expressions. This design has served us well because we haven't touched it anymore. We just made some course correction which are more like uh, tactical changes. The first one was in May of this year, where we realized that if we were going to wait for the compiler to be able to run on the Dart VM, we were going to wait a long time before delivering, some, delivering something valuable to us and the community. So we decided to broaden the, the capacity of the compiler while in hosted environment. Up to now, our only goal with the compiler while running in Clojure on the DJVM was to be able to compile itself. Now we made changes to be able to compile any user application with the compiler hosted on JVM. The second correction that occurred is the realization that as we were going better at emitting Dart code, the more precise the types we were producing, the more types we have to get right. It kind of snowballed and we had to bite the bullet and really produce good type inference across all the libs using the Dart analyzer and so on. And uh, this is what has mainly kept us busy since uh, the end of the summer. Besides the compiler, we have 80% um, complete closure implementation. Some things are lacking, like sorted collections or multi methods. Otherwise, we have most of core, some auxiliary namespaces, we have good interrupt with Dart. All closure collections are Dart collections and Dart collections can be passed to closure functions. We, we support generics, which is important because in Dart, generics are not erased like in Java. We also support the name parameters. We have a lot of things, but interrupt was really important to us. It's even the first thing that we prototyped because one of the pillar of closure is its interrupt capacity with the host. Let's cover some specifics about Dart. Well, about closure Dart. The first thing is optionals. So in Dart, a method can only have one signature. There are no overloads for a given method, but it can have some optional parameters, either positional or named. For a long time, we had a special syntax for the named par parameters. We used the dot in person to tell the compiler where the, the name parameters were starting. We don't need it anymore because we have the static information needed to know how many fixed parameters are expected. You are just going to write what seems the more natural keywords to denote the name of the parameters, and that's all. Another point of difference between 
closure and closure guard is that in Dart, types are not enabled by default. This is, this is something that changed over the course of the project. It was on, on the, in the pipeline when we started, but we chose to ignore Dart 212 introduced non-enable types by default. It means that when you've got a function in Dart that returns string, it's not going to return a nil. And so it means that for a closure function like namespace, which may return a string or may return nil, you can't type int a string in closure Dart. You have to type int a string question mark. We doubled with the idea of reversing the behavior and have a string by itself denote string or nil and string exclamation mark denotes strictly a string. But after some, some experimentation, we realized that it was going to create more confusion and more distance with the host. So we keep the dot way, which is to put a question mark at the end of the type. Still speaking about nil, in closure, everything is true except for false and nil. And it's the same in closure dart. However, to make tests more efficient, when we know that we are going to get a bool, we don't test for nil. When something is clearly not a boolean, like it's a string question mark, we only test for nil. When, as a user, we know that it's not going to be a boolean, we can use the sum metadata. For example, the seek function is going to re return either nil or a sequence. And a sequence is whatever implements the sequence protocol. So we can type what a sequence is in Dart, but we know that it's not go going to be a boolean. So we have this sum pseudotype specific to closure Dart to be able to tell the compiler it's going to be nil or something which is definitely not a bool. Now, generics are not erased in Dart. In Java, generics only exist at the level of the Java compiler. For the JVM, they don't exist, so you can bypass many things. It's not the case in Dart. First change is that we need a way to encode the information about a parameterized type. And we have this constraint that the closure reader expect a type in to be either a symbol or a string. So we could have chose to encode in a string the parameter's type, but it has drawbacks because you have to parse the string and you lose structured editing once you are in a string. After some head scratching, we came up with the idea of putting the type parameters in metadata on the symbol. By the symbol, I mean the symbol representing the type. So you put meta on the metadata. It's frankly a bit bizarre. But we realized that we could leverage taglets to emit this, uh, this symbol with metadata. And so we have a taglet rule for slash, which allows us to write list question mark string to denote an optional list of string. Another thing about the generics is that they impact collections. Because when in Dart or in Flutter, you have something which expects a list of widgets. You can't pass a person vector as the list of widgets because a person vector can hold anything helpful. In the Dart collections API, there are cast methods which are a bit magic because they are parameterized by their return type, but they allow to wrap a collection of a given type into a collection of another type. For example, a list of objects can become a list of string. It's just a wrapper. The list is still a list of objects underneath and uh, the type of the actual elements will only be checked on demand when they are retrieved from the list, by, for example. So you are moving a static errors to the dynamic realm. It offers 
us a way to transform our personal vector of object, which is a dot collection, a dot list, to a list of widgets. But sadly, once you go this way, the object that you have is the list wrapper from dot. It's not a personal vector anymore. So it goes against an important uh, design, design constraint of uh, closure which is to avoid wrappers at all costs. Then we realized that we could have type parameters on closure collections. These type parameters would be totally ignored. They are there only to placate the dot type system. And so when you need to cast a persistent vector to be a persistent vector widget, we are just creating a new root which has the correct type, but it's still a person vector implementing all the, the closure protocols being still equal to the previous one. And currently we are working on getting the compiler to insert the cold cast itself so that you don't even have to care about your vector not being of the right type. There will be a dynamic vault to be able to be one when this magic behavior occur by default it will be it will be on while we are on dynamic vaults in closure you've got uh, one on reflection in closure dot the equivalent thing which is one on dynamic is on by default because it's more important in our opinion in dot to get the correct types. So when closure dot struggles to determine the type of an expression for interrupt, it's going to complain. Another thing about dot is how do we require a dot lib from a namespace? Here, we chose to do it in the same way that closure script does. If the namespace is denoted by a string, then it's going to, to be a dot lib. Another thing which is important in Dart because it's leveraged by a lot of API is that Dart has built-in support for async and await. So our first reaction was, okay, we've got core async. But core async is a world on its own. Core async has no good interrupt story. And here we have something built in the language and the standard library. So we need to offer something low level to be able to leverage that asynchronous feature. It's pretty simple. We introduce a new special form, a weight. So to summarize, we learn that so you don't have to, so that you can reach out to mobile, to desktop, to native applications without having to learn the language, only learn the, the, lib, the libraries and in particular to learn Flutter. Now, Batist is going to give you a short demo of what it is to code with Closure Dart. Hello friends, I am Batist, the other half of uh, Transegritix and the Closure Dart compiler. I have four minutes to show you what it's like to use uh, Closure Dart for writing iOS and Android applications. So basically I have um, a scaffold application with only text. If I edit text here, this text is not centered. I have to recompile closure that file, reload the application, and yeah, we see the text. So now what I want to do is just build a list of dates uh, in French. Um, so to do that, we need to use the list view component, which is a default component from Flutter. List view takes a children property, which is a list of widgets. <clears throat> so, def list view, it takes children, and as input, we have a persistent vector of strings, of dates. So, I want to build some Flutter widget. I'm going to use the list tile widget, which is just a tile. 
basically and it takes a title which is also a widget so uh, material list style and it takes a title which is a widget so i have to use widgets text and i can give him the input one so now let's try to compile it list view we compile that we load the application oh it doesn't work and it doesn't work because children wait for a list of widgets and we gave him a persistent vector of dynamic so persistent vector uh, implement list uh, so this part is good but dynamic is not widget so on this version of the compiler we have to cast inputs it will be done automatically um, magically when uh, the compiler is open source so we just cast this vector of widgets we reload Oh, now we have a list of days in French. We can even add some other components. Let's say we want a divider, material divider. And here we go. So basically we use, we are using Clojure Data Structure to build our widgets. Um, we have a lot more experience now with bigger applications and it's been a blast. We are very excited to open source Closure Dart soon. Um, we still have some work to do on uh, type emission and uh, magic casting, like you can see. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks a lot. Bye. So I guess that by now, your main question is when can we get our own on Closure Dart? There are some things that we want to fix. First, finish the work on type inf inference. There are still some things to, to tune. And there's the introduction of the magic cast. And last, there's something about interrupt, which is pretty important. It's about how Dart functions and closure functions relate. With more experience with Dart now and a better understanding of the language, we are questioning some design choices that we made earlier. So our current estimate is to release Closure Dart in the first quarter 2022. Finger crossed. Last thing, this work wouldn't have been possible or not at this pace without the support, the faithful support of our sponsors. I, I say faithful because these are people sponsoring us, believing in us, even if currently all you get is vapor war. There are dozens of individuals who helped us and two companies, New Bank and Home Research, both supported and still support our work. So thanks to you all for listening and thanks to, to our sponsors again for helping us bring a new closure implementation that will increase the reach of closure. Thanks.